In Pokemon, Stab stands for Same Type Attribute Bonus. It's a boost that every Pokemon gets when they use a move with the same type as them. For example, Ember, normally a 40 base power move, becomes 60 power when used by a Fire Pokemon. But today, we're going to attempt to beat Establish Hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Leaf Green. Let's see how it goes. Let me know in the comments section who you think are some of the best Kanto established Pokemon. Maybe I'll end up using them, but let's not all say Gyarados, okay? We already know how good he is. My name is Boy, and I name my rival Shake. Here, I spent a good amount of time trying to figure out who the best starter is, and while Bulbasaur would certainly make the first gym a heck of a lot easier, we'll see why in a little bit, Blastoise has a much better range of moves than Venusaur does. And since I used Charmander in my last Kanto Nuzlocke, I go with Squirtle, and I name him Squirtless, cause he's got no squirts. Which normally you think would be a good thing, but not in this case. Squirtless and I then proceed to lose against Shanks, not just once, but two times in a row. For the life of me, I can't even remember the last time I lost to my rival once, let alone twice. So we're already off to a pretty bad start. The third time we finally win, but I'm kind of already regretting Squirtless. Maybe Bulbless would have been a better choice. I try to go to Viridian Forest, but there's a dead man blocking the road. Alright, so I help out Professor Oak, get a Pokedex, and finally some Pokeballs. On Route 1, I catch my first Pokemon, a Pidgey. Now we'll quickly find out that normal type Pokemon really suck in this run. I mean, not all of them, sure, but Pidgey, for example, will never be able to use any attacking move, because they're all either normal or flying. So yeah, I name him Wingless, and then I catch a Toothless Rattata on Route 2, and a Punchless Mankey on Route 22. The Mankey can actually attack, so he'll be pretty useful. After a bit of rare candies, there is no way I'm switch training all of these Pokemon, I am ready to get shanked. And in this battle, we're going to see how truly difficult the first part of the game can be. For example, the only move that Toothless can use is Tail Whip. He can't do any damage. So, after about three Tail Whips, I bring out Squirtless, who gets sand attacked, but does a decent amount with Tackle. A few more Tackles takes out the Pidgey, while Squirtless gets into the yellow. So I bring out Wingless, who also only has one move he can use, Sand Attack. So I Sand Attack until a crit might kill him, then Punchless arrives with his Scratch. Bulbasaur only hits two Tackles before falling to a Scratch Attack. As far as rival battles go, that wasn't particularly difficult but I did play it relatively safely, because I'm going to need all of these Pokemon if I want to try and beat Brock. It's really going to suck. First, I catch a Stingless Weedle in Viridian Forest, which is unfortunate because I really could have used a Butterfree. With Confusion and all of the status powders, he would have been much better. Oh well. At the level cap, I'm ready to fight Brock and his... <clears throat> Pokemon. And will do my best to not lose anybody, but no promises, alright? Against his Geodude, Pidgey manages to use six sand attacks, which is pretty awesome, and then I bring out Stingless, who immediately takes a tackle, which is not as awesome. I then go for Fury Attack. I really wish I could use Poison Sting here, but it's stabbed, so I can't do it. All the while, Geodude is using Defense Curl, but Fury Cutter will ensure I at least do a few hit points of damage no matter how high his defense is, and the crits will bypass the defense boosts. Eventually, with a few crits in a row, the Geodude goes down. And if you think that was a long fight, just you wait for his Onyx. Again, I really want to use Poison Sting here, but I can't. Instead, I use String Shot to lower his speed as he misses with Rock Tomb. So I get to use another one before almost dying to a Rock Tomb. Toothless comes out, Onyx misses another Rock Tomb as I just use Tail Whip. After another Tail Whip, I decide to sacrifice Toothless to get one last Tail Whip in, and Onyx misses again. Wow. It's pretty obvious here that Toothless wants to live, so I need to bring out Squirtless instead, as Onyx misses yet again. Okay, maybe this won't be as hard as I thought. This Onyx can't hit anything. Squirtless continues whipping his tail, and once Onyx is at minus six defense and his bind wears off, Wingless comes back out to sand attack again. Onyx gets me with a bind, but misses two Rock Tombs, and then starts using Tackle. So at this point, I'm pretty sure his Rock Tomb PP is finally out. With minus accuracy, as well as minus six defense, Punchless comes out, and I can't use Low Kick, obviously, but I can use Scratch. 
After two times scratching the rock, getting two crits in a row, we kill it on the third. Again, this fight would have been way easier with Bulbasaur because I could have just leet seated and stalled, but I think Squirtlish should pay off in the long run once he evolves. At least, I hope so. And don't worry, the other gyms shouldn't be that long and drawn out. On my way to Cerulean, I catch Fearless the Spiro, which looking back at it now, that's a much nicer name than Squirtless, so sorry Squirtless. I buy Splashless the Magikarp and catch Crowless the Zubat, who very quickly learns Bite, meaning I have another Pokemon who can finally attack. I get through Mount Moon and use the Move Tutors to teach Mega Kick to Punchless and Mega Punch to Squirtless. I'm not a big fan of their low accuracy, but these moves are way too strong to pass up. Just like Stab gives your Pokemon bonus attack power, subscribing to my channel and enabling notifications will give you bonus videos. That way you won't be bored and complaining like this old man that there's nothing to watch on TV. Okay, shameless plug over, back to the run. Now even though in Cerulean I normally fight my rival before Misty, I decided to swap things around because that's what this run is all about. And for that reason, I also decide to use Focus Energy because it's a move that I basically never use. Then I just go for Mega Kick. But watching this gameplay, Fury Swipes would have been a better move than Mega Kick, especially after the Focus Energy and Staryu using Harden so many times. Either way, Punchless takes out the Staryu and got pretty lucky with the kicks, to be honest. Starmie comes out and I bring out Toothless on a Water Pulse. All he needs to do here is Scary Face to slow down the Starmie. But since he survives a second Water Pulse, that I didn't think he would, I decide to not sacrifice him. Instead, Squirtless comes out on what was supposed to be another Water Pulse, that wasn't, outspeeds the Starmie, and eventually takes it out with bites, even after the Starmie recovers. I didn't expect this gym to be very difficult. After all, I had two Water Types and three Pokemon with bite, so Misty didn't really stand a chance. And somehow, Toothless survived yet another gym battle. I've tried to sack him twice, but he just doesn't want to go. As I head north, Shank tries to sneak up on me and, well, shank me. But we have a Pokemon battle instead. Splashless starts off against his Pidgeotto and manages to make it flinch twice in a row, but then gets sand attacked and quick attacked before finally taking it out. I want to pit Toothless against his Rattata, but he can't attack at all, so that'll be a waste. Instead, I send out Crowless on a Tail Whip to take the thing out with two bites. This brings out Abra, who is basically free experience because he can't do anything. Finally, Stab sends out his ace, Bulbasaur. And since Crowless is at minus two defense, I pivot to Fearless, who promptly falls asleep. Which actually turned out to be a good thing because I temporarily forgot that Fearow is normal type and I try to use Fury Attack here instead of Pursuit. If I had been awake, it would have been game over and I'd have to restart the run. But then I get Leech Seated, so it's time for Splashless, who once again flinches this guy twice in a row before avoiding Sleep Powder and finishing off the fight with one last bite. After destroying all the people on Nugget Bridge, I find myself an Abra, which is a pretty great encounter. But my Pokeball doesn't catch him, and he books it, as Abras tend to do. Too bad. On Route 25, I catch a Caterpie who I name Butterless. She immediately goes on the team and evolves. You would have been really helpful a bit earlier, but hey, I'm not complaining. I help out Bill with his little Pokemon problem and try to make some friends, but apparently you need to be on a date to hang out here. That's lame. And probably discrimination. Come on, guys. I get the Dig TM back and try to give it to its owner, who just says that apparently Diglett learned how to dig on his own, which you couldn't figure out by the name Diglett in relatively quick succession. I catch a Vineless Bellsprout, a Payless Meowth, and a Digless Diglett in Diglett Tunnel. Man, that's a lot of digging. At this point, I'm not gonna relay all my encounters because it's just too much, but if you have a question where I caught anybody, just let me know. I board the SSN, which is one of my favorite music tracks in the game, by the way. Just listen to this masterpiece. I almost don't wanna talk over it. And just like my last Kanto remake run, I immediately run to the kitchen trash for berries. Berries are a rare thing in this game, so a little bit of trash digging is acceptable. With trash berries safely stored in my bag, it's time to fight Shank. And this fight does take a little while, because I need to swap around my Pokemon a few times, but eventually Stingless takes us to victory with Fury Attack, so I'm not going to show the whole thing. I leave the ship, and even though I have a ticket, it takes off without me. That's pretty rude, isn't it? Oh well, I guess it's time to fight Lieutenant Surge. 
after looking through even more trash, that is. These ones, though, don't have any berries. Against his Voltorb, I start with Diglis, who goes for a scratch and gets Sonic boomed, and almost kills with Fury Swipes, only for Lieutenant Surge to heal. That's okay. At 17 health, another Sonic Boom will kill me, so I swap to Punchless on a Tackle, who takes out the Voltorb in two turns. But then he gets into the yellow. Pikachu comes out next, so Vineless comes out on a Thunder Wave, which is fine. I get fully paralyzed as Pikachu double teams, then I connect with a wrap on the next turn, and kill with a cut after one more quick attack. Surge's ace, Raichu, immediately double teams, but then gets put to sleep. And Surge heals with a full heal. That's not really fair, as I miss a wrap. I decide to bring out Sandless the Sand Slash, who gets paralyzed by static, but still finishes off the Raichu in two slashes. Not using Stab in this fight wasn't all that bad, to be honest. I mean, it would have made it easier for sure with Diglett and Sand Slash, but aside from Voltorb's Sonic Boom, Surge is effectively walled by Grass and Ground Pokemon, even if they don't use Stab. At this point, because he survived so many gyms already, I decide to put Toothless into the daycare center and see how many levels he can get by the end of the game. Let me know in the comments how many you think it'll be. Now, I'm not really looking forward to Rock Tunnel, because without Stab, I can't do much to Rock Pokemon with the exception of Bite, I suppose. But it's time to introduce to you a major player in this run, and that is Payless. I believe you've met before. Payless can learn Water Pulse, which makes Rock Tunnel a heck of a lot easier. Oh, and against non-Rock Pokemon, Sandless with his Slash is a complete beast. These are two Pokemon who I can't really remember the last time I used in any real way, and I'm a big fan of them already. I get through Rock Tunnel and get to the town with the creepiest music. I was straight up scared of the Lavender Town and Pokemon Tower as a kid, but I'm proud to say I have outgrown that fear. Mostly. That white hand thing still gets me. In Celadon, I get through the rocket puzzles that in reality would make me throw up. I just can't handle spinning that much. After losing my lunch and a bit of my dignity, I beat my way through Team Rocket and I'm ready to fight Giovanni. His Onyx goes down to a single Water Pulse from Payless, as does his Rhyhorn. Against his Kangaskhan, Splashless comes out because of her Intimidate and to deal almost no damage with Return. I guess our relationship is a lot more one-sided than I had realized. I thought we had a connection here, Splashless. That's okay. I can handle it. After a few Dragon Rages, Giovanni loses and drops a Sylph Scope for me. So, I head back to the not-at-all scary Pokemon Tower that certainly does not haunt my dreams. There, I find my rival, who threatens to shank my Pokemon, as always. But Sandless, combined with Splashless, are more than enough to take out his entire team. After this fight, Shank reveals how little he actually knows about Pokemon, saying that he caught a Cubone, but he doesn't know where to get Marowak. You don't have to find it, just evolve the Pokemon you already have, it's not that hard. I save Mr. Fuji, then head back to Celadon to fight Erika. But now, I have a secret weapon, and that is Punchless, who can learn Aerial Ace. So, after using a precious Trash Berry to heal Paralysis, Victory Bell goes down in two hits. Tangela survives one hit, and does manage to poison me, unfortunately. And then the Vileplume hits a really strong Giga Drain, that with all the poison damage I'm taking, would actually have killed me if it crit. Well, it didn't, so I guess I got lucky. Can I just say, in this fight specifically, I wish that Primeape had Guts, I mean, it makes sense for him to have, doesn't it? Still, a not gutsy punchless wins me the fourth badge with relatively little problems, even though there was a bit of luck involved. I wake up a Snorlax and manage to catch him in the second Great Ball, which was surprisingly easy. I was ready to drop like 20 of these guys. I call him Snorless. It's around this time that Diglis, the now Doug Trio, dies against a random trainer, though his death didn't actually get recorded, which is probably for the best, to be honest. I mean, I wouldn't want my death to be recorded and shown here on YouTube for a couple thousand views either. Continuing on, I get to Fuchsia, where I find this weirdo who wants to be a baby Kangaskhan and snuggle in a mother's pouch. Alright. Before moving on with the story, I need to start EV training my Pokemon, because things are getting a bit more difficult. Not using Stab is catching up to me. I use Experience Share, and that makes EV training a bit easier. Just look at how much those stats went up in a single level. That's awesome. After some intense training, I think I'm ready to fight my rival in Silphco. But I have another surprise on Payless. Shockwave. 
Persian's range of moves is actually pretty awesome, much better than I had realized before doing this run. The Pidgeot goes down in two hits, bringing out the Gyarados, who survives, uses Dragon Rage, but then falls to one more Shockwave. Against the Growlithe, I can't risk losing Payless here, so I swap to Squirtless, who knocks it out with a dig. This baits out the Venusaur, so Butterless comes out, tanks a Razor Leaf, and confuses with Psybeam. That was lucky. Venusaur hits himself twice in a row before going down. Last is the Alakazam, who Butterless can't really do that much to, but she can paralyze him. Then I swap back to Squirtless, who uses Bite, as Alakazam goes for a third Calm Mind, but eventually falls to a Mega Punch. If that Alakazam had started attacking, things would have been really rough. But hey, he didn't. Fortunately, the Giovanni fight is a lot faster and easier. Butterless takes out his Nidorino and two Psybeams, and only takes a little bit from Fury Attack. Just like before, Payless takes out the Rhyhorn after getting scary faced, but that doesn't matter, he's way faster than this rock. Nidoqueen does outspeed and survives a crit water pulse, but she gets confused and never even gets a chance to hurt Payless. His last Pokemon is Kangaskhan again, but this time I have a Snorlus with leftovers and Brick Break. With just two broken bricks, Kangaskhan falls and we've beaten Giovanni for the second time. Why doesn't this guy just give up already? He can't beat me. Now it's time for a gym leader sweep, starting with Sabrina. And Splashless apparently likes me now because she one shot Kadabra with a return, as well as the Mr. Mime. The Venomoth actually survives and heals twice, but then goes down. And lastly, her Alakazam also goes down in one hit, winning us the easiest badge of the run by far. Before we jump ahead to Koga, I evolve Gastless the Haunter into a Gengar using the Universal Pokemon Randomizer and promptly teach him Psychic. With him as my secret weapon, I absolutely destroy all of Koga's Pokemon. Muck does survive a single Psychic and minimizes a few times, but he still dies before doing any damage. The beauty of Gastless here is that even if I didn't one-shot his coughings, they still couldn't blow up at me because I'm a ghost. It's really good to not have to worry about self-destructs in a Nuzlocke run. We only have two last badges, and if they're anything like the most recent ones, we're going to have them in no time. I go to the Safari Zone and tell myself that in the off chance I catch a pincer, I'll use him in the run. Instead, I find and catch a Nidorino, who I never use. Oh well. Once I've gotten Surf, as well as Strength, it's time to cross the ocean to Cinnabar on Snorlax the Snorlax. In the Burned Building, I read a journal talking about finding Mew in the jungles of South America. I completely forgot this was a thing. I mean, where exactly is South America in the poker world? After getting the gym key, I free all of Blaine's underpaid and overworked employees. I mean, Blaine literally locked all of these guys into the gym, and that's a huge fire hazard because they all have fire Pokemon. I decide to teach Blaine a lesson about how to be a decent human being by beating him up, because that's how you teach lessons. Snorlax takes a weak tackle from Growlithe, but knocks it out with a Surf. The Ponyta stomps me, and also falls to a Surf. A Quick Claw Snorlax hits Rapidash with a Surf, but then Rapidash bounces in the air and paralyzes me on the return. That's okay. Next turn, it also goes down. Now we have Blaine's last Pokemon, Arcanine. After taking two Surfs, Arcanine heals, and then the same thing happens again. At this point, I'm getting close to dying from a crit, so out comes Squirtless. This would be a good time to squirt some water, but he can't do that, obviously. Instead, he just misses out on the kill with a dig, takes very little from a fire blast, and finishes off the fire dog. I decide to relax a bit before the 8th gym and do some fishing. I get Clawless the Krabby, but who I'm really looking for is Starless the Starmie. Ever since my Johto Psychic run, I've been wanting to use Starmie again. At this point, I remember that I hate fishing, so let's just go to the gym. We start off the same way most of our fights have, with Payless killing the Rhyhorn with a Water Pulse. Big surprise. Nidoqueen comes out, so I swap to Splashless because Earthquake isn't going to get him. After two returns, the Queen goes down. Against the slightly stronger Rhyhorn, Payless comes back out, and even with a scary face, still outspeeds and gets a one-hit KO, because obviously. When the King comes out, we play the same game where I bring out Splashless to avoid the Earthquake, and take it out with two returns. After getting poisoned, which isn't great, but that's okay. 
Giovanni's last Pokemon is Doug Trio, who can't actually hurt Gengar, like at all. So I have some fun with this guy. First, I confuse it, then I use Curse, just for the fun of it, until finally killing it with a Nightshade. Embarrassed by his third defeat at the hands of a child, Giovanni disappears and dissolves Team Rocket. For the most part. They're still around three years from now, so who knows what he actually did. We still have one more major fight before the Elite Four, though, and that is against Shank. Gasless outspeeds and one-shots the Pidgeot with Thunderbolt, baiting out the Alakazam. I can't leave in Gasless, obviously, so Snorlax comes out, and I forget that he didn't have Bite, because he does in another run that I'm doing simultaneously. Okay, roll out it is. Alakazam goes down on the third hit, and Growlithe obviously just dies. And even with the Intimidate, the Rhyhorn still takes a ton of damage and rollout ends. Thankfully, I still have Surf. The Gyarados just dances in the rain as Gasless comes out and kills with a Thunderbolt. Shang's last Pokemon is Venusaur, who does survive a Psychic, but just wastes his turn with growth, allowing Gasless to take him out on the next turn. At this point, my time gets wasted because all these guards only check a single badge, which frustrates me every time I walk through here, but I make it out alive and through Victory Road to the Elite Four. There are a few last minute preparations I still have to do, however. First, I go to the power plant in search of wild magnetons, not to catch one. There is a 10% chance to find them here, and each one has a 5% chance to hold an item that I'm looking for, the magnet. So this may take a while. Or maybe it'll only take five minutes. That was really lucky. Feeling good about myself, I go to the Seafoam Islands to repeat the process, but with dugongs. And it takes a while, but eventually I find one, and I do steal an Asperberry. That's not at all what I was looking for. After only 17 more berries, I finally get a single Nevermelt Ice. That was a waste of time. Now it's on to Lorelei. Against her dugong, I lead with Gastless, who doesn't quite kill with a Thunderbolt, as Dugong uses Hail. Lorelei heals, but then Dugong falls to two more Thunderbolts. While I take some Hail damage, that's not that bad. Slowbro comes out next, and thanks to the Magnet, goes down in a single hit. Against the Lapras, I can't really risk losing Gasless to a Rogue Blizzard or something like that, but Snorlax should be able to tank anything she can throw at me, especially with Leftovers. I briefly consider using Rollout here, but Brick Break is a much safer option, I think, because I can still swap out if I need to. Lapras keeps hitting me with Surf, and after three Brick Breaks, she dies, bringing out the Cloister, who has really high defense, but not nearly as high special defense. So, I give Starless a chance to shine, because it also has Thunderbolt, as Cloister wastes a turn with Protect, and then Hail. After that, one Thunderbolt is all I need. Her last Pokemon is Jinx, that Starless can't really do all that much to, to be honest. But I go for a Thunderbolt anyway, and it ends up paralyzing. That was nice. I get put to sleep, so not so nice. I'm not really at risk of dying here, but I don't want to just wait to wake up. So out comes Squirtless, who bites but doesn't kill, and then goes to sleep as well. Okay, I'm just gonna wait this out. Jinx hits me a few times, but I eventually wake up and finish off the fight with a bite. Now it's on to Bruno, who's generally considered the worst Elite Four member. I once again lead with Gasless, who takes out the first Onyx with a Giga Drain. Hitmonchan survives a Psychic and lowers my speed with Rock Tomb, which isn't great, but it's okay. After he heals, two more Psychics and he goes down. Thankfully, Onyx comes out next, giving me a chance to heal with Giga Drain. Good stuff. Against Machamp, Psychic is not a one hit KO and he uses Scary Face. So now I'm at minus three speed and I'm actually pretty slow. Still, one more Psychic finishes it off. Hitmonlee comes out next and immediately uses Foresight, meaning he can now hit me and hit me hard. Psychic brings him to the red and he might heal, but I don't really want to risk a mega kick to the face because I'm obviously slower than him now. So I swap to Squirtless as he heals. Strength should be a two hit KO and I can tank a few brick breaks, but I guess strength is not a two hit KO and I can't tank a few brick breaks. Yikes. Still, I am faster, so I beat Bruno after one more hit. In hindsight, I could have immediately pivoted back to Gasless, and that would have been a much better solution, but that's okay, we still won. Now it's time for old lady Agatha. Who do you think I'm leading with? If you guessed Gasless, you are 100% correct. 
he is quickly becoming the MVP against the Elite Four. My Gasless takes out her Gengar with a single Psychic. I use Thunderbolt on the Golbat to preserve my Psychics, and it still knocks it out. The Hunter, unsurprisingly, also falls to a Psychic. As does the Arbok. I only have one Psychic PP left for her Gengar, and it kills her too. That was almost too easy, to be honest, but let's not complain, okay? It's time for the last Elite Four member, Lance. Here, I finally break tradition and let Starless lead the way. Starless uses Thunderbolt to take out the Gyarados in a single hit. Then, an Ice Beam for the Dragonair, and an Ice Beam for the Dragonair. Didn't we just say that? An Ice Beam for the Dragonite, we're mixing things up a little bit here, finally brings out his Aerodactyl. And Ice Beam barely misses out on the kill as he lowers my speed. He heals, of course, as I use another Ice Beam that freezes. He heals again, of course, we're just repeating everything here, and I swap to Thunderbolt just for fun. As a last ditch effort, Aerodactyl uses Hyper Beam that does exactly half of my health, meaning that a crit could have killed me. But it didn't, so I kill him with one last Thunderbolt. Even after beating all of these guys, I am not granted the rank of champion, because Shank got here first and used his also powerful stab moves to cheat his way to victory. But I am more powerful than him, so I can overthrow him. Starless leads the team against his Pidgeot. With a Nevermelt Ice, Ice Beam does more than Thunderbolt and should be a one-hit KO, which it is. That was nice. Out comes the Arcanine, who normally wouldn't be an issue for a Starmie, but alas, no water. Snorless, on the other hand, does have Surf, which looks like it might be a two-hit KO if I'm lucky, but it's not. Arcanine survives a second hit and then heals, of course. I get him back into the red, but now I'm at risk of dying to a crit extreme speed. So out comes Gasless, who avoids the normal attack, and kills Arcanine with a Thunderbolt. Against his Alakazam, Gasless would easily lose, so I bring out Squirtless, who can tank a couple of Psychics, and has leftovers. Squirtless bites, and then uses Protect to try and get some healing, but Alakazam used Future Sight anyway, so that was kind of a waste. That's okay. An Earthquake finishes off the Alakazam, baiting out the Venusaur. Now, the only attacking move this guy knows is Solar Beam, so I can get an Earthquake in, which does almost nothing, as I take the Future Sight, leaving me with only a little HP left. Here, I have no idea why I did this. Even though Squirtless very clearly has Protect, I swap into Punchless to take the Solar Beam when I could have just protected from it. That was such a dumb move, and I honestly can't explain it. So I'm sorry that you had to see that. That was horrible. I understand. Either way, Punchless survives, but wouldn't have if it crit, and takes out the Venusaur in two Aerial Aces. I really should just have left in Squirtless. Oh well. Rhydon comes out next, and I have several Pokemon who could take him, but I don't want to risk losing any of them to a crit. Instead, I use Dig to deal some damage as Punchless falls to an Earthquake. And this lets me bring out Payless for the home stretch. He uses Water Pulse, the move he's had basically his whole life, as Shank sends out his last Pokemon, Gyarados. For him, I use Thunderbolt, that gets a crit, knocking out the flying water snake thing. Now who's the strongest trainer in the world, Shank? Before we go to the credits, it's time to go to the daycare center and see how many levels Toothless has grown. This is your last chance to place your bets, everyone, and it ended up being 13 levels. I actually expected a lot more than that, to be honest, but oh well, that was a bit underwhelming. Fun fact, when I came back here to take out Toothless, I couldn't actually remember who I'd put into the daycare center because it had been such a long time. And with that, we have officially beaten established Hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Leaf Green. And to be honest, this was not as difficult as I initially thought it would be. Mainly because you have such awesome Pokemon like Persian, Gengar, and Starmie who have such great range when it comes to move types that they were able to basically destroy everything. Without Persian, early game rock Pokemon would have really sucked. But we did it, and with only two deaths too. I do feel really bad about Punchless because that was completely my mistake and he could have very easily survived because we were so close to the end. But I made a foolish mistake, and now he's dead. And that's something that I'm going to have to live with for the rest of my life. I'm considering doing the same type of run in other regions as well, so if that's something that you're interested in, be sure to like, subscribe, and just make sure this video gets a lot of likes and comments. 
But if I do continue this same type of run, there's going to be one important caveat. The major Pokémon I used in this game, specifically people like Persian, Gengar, Starmie, and probably Gyarados, I will not let myself use in the next game, because I don't want to just keep using the same Pokémon over and over. But that's kind of a ways down the line. In the next video, we're actually going to stay in Kanto, but it's going to be a very unique and meme-worthy run. I hope you like it, because it's taking a lot of work, and I hope to see you there.